Please help me welcome Andrew Knudsen to the stage. So that's the conditions that we're starting with. Uh, in terms of uh, evaluating the retail uh, market, we have centers, nodes, and corridors. And we have uh, national industry standards in terms of how to define retail centers. And here we have them all. The regional happens to be in the purple dots. Uh, these are typically 
between 750,000 square feet or more. Power centers shown in circles are um, often open air, uh, combination of large box, or big box and mid box stores, typically 300 to 500,000 square feet. Uh, community centers are often those around 300,000 300, square feet and are anchored by one large scale discount department store with ancillary around that. Neighborhood centers shown in a pent little pentagram symbol um, are, uh, are, neighbor are grocery anchored, typically about 60,000 square feet of the grocery center and 20 to 70,000 square feet of ancillary space around it. And then with a triangle, uh, we've got strip centers uh, anywhere from 20 to 75,000 square feet with a wide range of formats. So those are national standards and classifications for different types of centers. What we've done as part of this study is translate the national standards into calibrated typologies for Oklahoma City. And there's four typologies. We've got regional nodes, highway corridors, arterial corridors, and community nodes. And we're going to go through each of the four in the next four slides. So regional nodes, we've got four. We've got Quail Springs, uh, Penn Square, The Outlets, and Bricktown. Uh, interestingly enough, um, Penn Square was built in 1960. It's the oldest, and it, is, it performs the best. It has about $256 per square foot in annual sales, and uh, it has done well, it particularly has done well in attracting one of the market retail outlets. Uh, all of these retail centers have extremely low vacancies. Um, it's another example of how Oklahoma City is doing very well economically. Our second typology is highway corridors. Uh, the big, what's significant here and is uh, unique to Oklahoma City, many markets don't have this type of typology, is the linear configuration of these types of districts. Uh, the trade area is, is linear in nature as well as the actual shopping district. Arterial corridors, um, these are also linear in nature. They're more community serving with grocery, health and beauty, eating and drinking. There are five linear or arterial corridors in the city. Community nodes, um, uh, their concentrated activities, uh, they differ from quarters both in the size of their trade area and the manifestation of the built environment. Uh, they generally are, are two or more community centers combined. It's important to note, uh, this is kind of a subset of the overall analysis, but we do have community revitalization districts. There are 10 districts today. These are uh, historic in nature. They, in a previous era, performed much better than they do today. They're on the upswing. Some are more recovered than others, but they, are, they specialize in a unique uh, blend of eating and drinking and retail. This slide shows all nodes and corridors for the city. Uh, the goal of the effort is to not only develop typologies, which I've just shown you, but then to evaluate them to understand how they're performing. And that is what we're using in the policy framework. Uh, this slide shows all of these centers uh, graphed out. On the x-axis is the value per square foot, and the y-axis is the sales per square foot. Uh, as you can see, there's a positive correlation between the two. Uh, the purple are the regional nodes. Those are the strongest, both in land value and sales value, uh, in part because of the definition, right? They're regional in nature, and so they're pulling in all of this expenditure potential from the, large, from the whole region, and therefore have some very strong sales. Highway corridors are shown in aqua, arterial corridors shown in dark brown, and community nodes are shown in orange. Uh, generally, the smaller you get, the lower the performance, both in terms of sales per square foot and land value. So once you have all of these centers uh, within their typology charted out, as you see here, how do you define a strategy for them? This is uh, what we've done in the report. And basically what we have in the green are the strong centers. And here we want to reaffirm the strengths that exist in them today. In the yellow, it's revitalized. Uh, there's an, a need to strengthen them, uh, but they differ from the red which is to revision, which is significant repurposing, and in some cases, wholesale changes. Uh, there's case studies for each typology. Uh, we're not going to go into all four in this afternoon's presentation. We're just going to pick one. And in this case, it is, uh, oh, let me just mention that in each case study, uh, we've broken down action items related to the development and redevelopment, transportation and access, and organizational management issues.
So each typology has recommendations along these lines, and the goal is that the information is transferable to other uh, similar types of just shopping centers throughout the city. Um, in the report, we go through Penn Square, Northwest Expressway, the 59th Avenue, 44th Avenue, and Uptown, 23rd Street. Uh, in this case, we're just going to focus on the highway corridor, specifically the Northwest Expressway. So it's located on a six-lane divided highway. It's 2.5 miles long. Um, it it's, uh, has a combination of power and strip centers. It has low and high performers. Most are big box, some mid box. Uh, the diagonal nature of the highway uh, results in some traffic flow challenges. Uh, in this case, uh, we've classified it as revitalized, which if you remember from the previous slide, is yellow and it's the middle tier, <coughs> suggesting that there are some things that are working and some things that are not. Uh, you can see here uh, the top performing uh, stores within this, within this corridor are shown in green, uh, yellow are the next high performers, and then red and orange are the, are the peripheral, are the, they happen to be the low performers, and they also are on the periphery of the district. There's a direct correlation to the center activity, which is an important point that I want to revisit in a minute. Uh, policy recommendations, uh, there's a need to redevelop, uh, there's a need to right size the supply. Uh, I'll talk about national retail trends in a minute, but generally the uh, retail uh, sector as a whole was on a spending spree from about the mid 90s to about 2008. There was plenty of money for new development, and in 2008, with the Great Recession, all of that came to a stop. And now they're really scratching their heads in terms of where to invest, and nationally in general, uh, there's uh, concern about where to locate new product. Uh, notwithstanding that national context, uh, what do we do within this corridor? Uh, we do need to right size retail supply given the trade area and the amount of demand there is for retail. We need to consolidate uh, the stores, the proximity, uh, particularly between North Council Road and North MacArthur Boulevard, uh, redevelop the TJ Mack Center, retenant some of the spaces, um, transportation and access. I think this is pretty important. Uh, it's amazing how much better the center will perform if there's coherency and clarity about where shoppers should go how to get in, how to get out, how to move around when you're in the inside. It seems like really basic 101, and it is really basic 101, and it's challenging because over the years, particularly on these corridors, as they develop over time with different land ownerships, with different tenanting, and a sequence of doing it over time differently, there's a lot of confusion in terms of how to make it work. Uh, one of the goals for any good, successful shopping center developer is to achieve cross-shopping. That's what we call the whole um, activity of multiple trips and multiple expenditures from a single parking stop. Uh, big challenge is, and is very prevalent in Oklahoma City, are the standalone independent anchors. It's really challenging because what really starts to drive success are the ancillary stores that typically pop up around the anchors. And it, it's fairly prevalent here where you have independent anchors without any ancillary. Thereby, the community foregoes the opportunity to have multiple shopping trips, multiple shopping expenditures out of a single visit. Um, so the goal is to be able to uh, create clarity uh, for automobile drivers as well as pedestrians with the goal of being able to increase the number of expenditures out of a given trip. Uh, certainly, so specifically in terms of transportation, transportation and access, create interior linkages between centers, consolidate and define primary entries, and use the right of way to increase, enhance the streetscape and the signage. So some of the same material we were seeing in the visual, uh, community appearance survey uh, also is, is coming up in the technical analysis of the different centers. And this is some of the visual uh, depictions of what should change. I want to just bring some attention to the yellow stars for enhanced entryways, uh, the orange arrows that, that are really the uh, greater automobile connections, uh, red shows redevelopment areas, and then blue, specific retail redevelopment areas, and blue shows the oversupply of retail uh, with redevelopment opportunities that would be other than retail. 
Again, consolidating, maximizing the activity and the expenditure going on in a, in a more concentrated location. In terms of the implementation strategy, we've got five goals for the plan. Uh, develop and maintain a ro robust retail sector. Uh, sales tax, as we talked about earlier, is just the lifeblood of the fiscal system. Uh, prevent outflow. Uh, that's a big challenge, particularly as communities outside Oklahoma City start to develop their own retail programs. Those dollars that are currently inside are going to start to flow outside. Another form of outflow is a former resident of Oklahoma City that might move outside the city and take all their dollars with them. Uh, maintaining uh, residents and maintaining retail within the city and retaining those expenditures is central to the goal, to the overall goals. Uh, attracting one of the market uh, retailers is, is critical. One of the market retailers are those that will, um, they will not, their specialty stores, Nordstrom's is an example for, uh, for you to think about. Uh, they are high-end apparel and they locate in one store in any given market is their business model. And the one in the markets are particularly good at reinforcing the regional uh, capabilities of existing centers in Oklahoma City. It just reinforces the inflow from the larger region. Uh, encourage growth to occur in a smart growth pattern. Smart growth is kind of a charged word. We uh, were doing an extensive study a couple of years ago and we actually dropped it because it, we just found it polarized the whole conversation and it, it, it prevented people from really understanding but at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is just simple uh, design guidelines that create clarity about where people need to be able to walk and where shoppers need to be able to drive. Um, and then ultimate, as also as part of the development or the plan goals, uh, the classification that we've developed that tailor the typologies in Oklahoma City relative to national standards is an important part of the plan. National trends. This is pretty interesting. Um, the retail sector is overbuilt. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of capital flowing into retail in the last decade prior to the Great Recession, and those dollars have been, that spigot has been turned off. Um, there's been a lot of closures and consolidations. For example, Office Depot and Office Max have consolidated. Uh, retail is hurting uh, in a way that they haven't been, uh, certainly in the last decade. Uh, part of the challenge is e-commerce. Uh, e-commerce is surprisingly small. Uh, most people think it's much larger than 5.5% of total retail sales that it does represent. However, although it's still small in total dollars, it's growing very quickly. Uh, it's 18%, it has an 18% growth rate over the last 10 years. Or 18% of the growth is attributed to e-commerce. Um, average store sizes are trending smaller. Uh, we're seeing Best Buys as inline stores now, uh, which is surprising given the fact that they've been a huge big box or a mid box over the years. Um, mid market uh, department stores are struggling. There's a big bifurcation in terms of the high end and low end, and dollars are either migrating up or down. And anything in the mid market, whether it be for department stores, Sears and JC Penney's are the examples here, uh, or even uh, grocery stores is also the case, where the dollars are either flowing up to Whole Foods or down to Walmart, and the traditional grocery stores in the middle of the market are really suffering. Um, oversupply of older shopping center space. Uh, this is a conundrum that many communities are facing, uh, very similar to Oklahoma City. What do you do with the arterials that are just, uh, the trade areas have migrated beyond where they used to be 20, 30 years ago? Uh, there is an oversupply of retail space, and uh, the reuse of some of this retail are very um, low intensity uses with very low rents and not the vibrancy that they used to have. And as a result, the whole centers start to either stay vacant or don't perform the way they used to. Redevelopment plans for this oversupply are a big challenge for, any, for many communities. Uh, so where Oklahoma City can go relative to all of these challenges are there. Are there are specifically represented on this slide in terms of specific retail store types that are not present here that could be recruited and attracted to the market. Uh, we've got the department store category with Von Mar, Costco, Nordstrom. Um, Costco isn't exactly a department store, it's a membership store, but nonetheless uh, large scale. Lifestyle tenants, we'll revisit the lifestyle, uh, potential lifestyle tenants because there's an opportunity for a lifestyle center 
which has big potential uh, to change the retail landscape and the community landscape with the introduction of something at that scale. Uh, mass merchandisers generally are on, uh, they are more than any other retail component uh, contracting these days, so less activity and less opportunity there. Grocery, big opportunity, and here we have Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Sprouts, Avanza, or Pro's Ranch, all of which would be good to introduce into the market here. Uh, I've got five recommendations, uh, and that will conclude this presentation. Uh, the first one is the potential for lifestyle retail. Um, there is a uh, destination retail, um, there is a potential for a lifestyle retail center to be developed. Ideally, we would recommend either uh, as a town center in Quarter Shore or in Brooktown. Uh, the lifestyle center is large scale, uh, typically open air, typically high end ancillary stores that collectively create an anchor in and of themselves. Uh, some of the lifestyle tenants, I'll just go back. Uh, Urban Outfitters, Crate and Barrel, REI, Restoration Hardware. Uh, those are examples of the types of tenants that you can get into the Lifestyle Center. And uh, there's currently, uh, it's missing in the Oklahoma City market, and uh, there's a big opportunity there. It has to be well planned, and particularly as a town center in Port Shore, would be an excellent way to anchor Port Shore and also provide enough ample land, sufficient land area to come up with a creative, effective design and site plan. Uh, the next bullet, strengthen and expand destination retail. Um, there are very successful regional retail centers today. Um, however, what can you do with them? How do you expand them? How do you leverage the strength that they exhibit? How do you make them perform better over time? How do you open up opportunities, either for redevelopment or expansion? These are all challenging and uh, are a specific recommendation uh, to, to create plans to allow the expansion particularly to attract additional one-in-the-market retailers. Uh, grocery is a specific area of recommendation. Uh, there's currently a food desert in northeast Oklahoma City and a need for a grocery store there. The plan identifies specific tenants and even specific locations for how that might work and be included in the market. Uh, another, another big opportunity would be a Hispanic grocery store. Uh, Abanza or Pro's Ranch would be good. We've worked in other markets. Uh, Pro's Ranches are incredible shopping experiences. I mean, they're large scale and high volume, high energy. Uh, it's amazing what you can find in the Pro's Ranch group. And we think that there's an opportunity to bring one to Oklahoma City. Um, also, a natural grocer. We think that that would be important, uh, particularly in terms of the uh, symbiotic relationship between retail and residential. Uh, creating a uh, hub with a natural grocery in Midtown or Deep Deuce would do that much more to spur the residential development opportunities in those two areas. Number three, uh, establish a critical mass of retail in or near downtown. Um, downtown suffered losses of its retail uh, back in the 60s and 70s when the exodus occurred out to the perimeter locations and it has never really recovered. Um, it's reestablishing uh, retail in downtown is critical to the overall vibrancy of downtown, particularly if it becomes a 24-hour city with a range of uses, particularly mixed use. Uh, I think it's important, we recommend and think it will be important to strategize in terms of where this critical mass of retail occurs. Uh, certainly the lifestyle center that I talked about before in Bricktown or Quarter Shore would fulfill this type of goal. There may be other ways to bring in something smaller scale, but nonetheless continue to take advantage of all of the investments in downtown and make that work for residential and retail. Number four, uh, plan a new regional node. Uh, this, um, based on the growth uh, projections for the region, uh, we think that there's potential for 2.5 million square feet of new retail through 2030. Half of this retail is likely to occur in existing centers and just backfill the vacancies that are occurring there. Half of that, half of 2.5 million square feet, can occur in new construction. And how do you create this new construction in nodes where you really do start to get that, that synergy between anchors and ancillary? Um, it also um, 
is important. I mentioned this earlier, but retail in, in many ways is becoming a commodity where whatever mall you go into, whether it's Denver, Salt Bay, Tucson, where, what have you, it's all the same, right? And the retailers get that. And it, it, it alarms them because things are really starting to become so very predictable. So uh, to the extent that a regional retail node in Quarter Shore uh, or some other downtown location can really start to create a unique presence of retail, that would be amazing and uh, also a very important goal. Uh, finally, uh, the last recommendation is to partner with Penn Square to develop a plan specifically to accentuate and accommodate the expansion there. Uh, there's ways that the center, the center is performing very well. It's the top performing center in the region. Uh, it's very important uh, in terms of the city strategy to continue to attract inflow, uh, but it's hemmed in and its retail options are limited. So uh, planning with it, planning with the owners uh, and figuring out a subarea plan that accommodates uh, how to expand it, also creating some uh, organizational management structures such as a business improvement district, what, what have you, something like that to manage uh, the surrounding area. It was built in the 60s, it has developed over time, it needs better clarity of what's going on and that business organization can help there. So those, that concludes our presentation on retail with our recommendations and open for questions. Thank you.